Good evening, all. Um, I should say at the outset that um, I'm here this evening in my personal capacity and not as a representative of NASA. So uh, any views I'll share are, are truly my own, not to be confused with uh, NASA or anyone else. I'm delighted to introduce our keynote presenter, Dr. Namrata Goswami, an independent scholar of space policy and great power politics. And I will <clears throat> not stand uh, between you and the main event this evening uh, by reciting all of Namrata's many accomplishments. Uh, most relevant for present purposes, Namrata was awarded a Minerva grant uh, by the Office of the US Secretary of Defense to study great power competition in outer space. And is the author with Peter Gerritsen of Scramble for the Skies, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space. With that, I will hand the floor to you, Namrata, for your keynote. Uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Asia Society Northern California for having me. It's such an honor today. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so in the 15 minutes that I have, uh, what I'm going to do is talk a bit about what the book actually consists of. So uh, this book actually, as Brian mentioned, was supported and funded. The project itself was supported by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So what Peter and I actually set up to do in about 2016 was to actually see whether there is a conceptualization within countries for looking at space, not just from a national security perspective, not from the Cold War kind of perspective, which was very much based on prestige and ideological rivalry, but whether there was actually a conversation about space from an economic perspective. And we actually arrived at the research proposal looking at primary documents of countries like the US, China, India to an extent, but also countries like Luxembourg, UAE, and Japan. And so the book actually has case studies of several of those countries. So why is space critical today before I go into the gist of the book? So this is basically uh, Euroconsul puts out this excellent assessment of what is the uh, economic contribution of space. So today, actually, if you look at the investment in space from different countries in the world, it's about 92.4 billion. So this was a 2021 data. And you can see that the U.S. actually dominates, but you also see countries like China, India, uh, Japan increasing their expenditure as well. What was even more interesting and fascinating from this graphic is that despite COVID-19 and the impact it had on several countries, space investment actually saw an 8% increase, which was a very interesting development for me, looking at space from the economic and national security perspective. Now, what does the book actually talk about? So uh, based on uh, primary and secondary research, uh, including fieldwork in the US, China, and India. So we came to the conclusion that what is interesting is that the discourse around space is changing today. So unlike, as I mentioned before, space is not just seen from a support function to terrestrial uh, you know, operations or just looking at space as a contribution to Earth it actually is becoming a lot about looking at space itself as a value, which is a very interesting change. And this we could see in some of the primary documents coming out of China and also the former uh, president of India, Abdul Kalam, gave this excellent speech on how space actually consists of resources that humanity can utilize by 2050 when the population of Earth becomes 9 billion. So it's a futuristic perspective, but it's also based on what policymakers in the countries speak about. Now, the other important point I thought the book makes is that it talks about how space is becoming a critical component of national power. So space is not seen as just something out there. Space is seen as a very critical asset. And you can see this, for example, in the case study of China that we study. So based on our interviews, uh, we came to the conclusion that China is actually looking at space not just from a national security perspective or ideological perspective, but actually as critical infrastructure. And in uh, April of 2020, uh, the China National Development and Reform Commission included space as part of their priority investment and also the economic returns that it promises. Now, uh, what is interesting is that in the, in the period that we studied, we also saw a phenomenal rise of the private sector in space also developing capabilities like reusability that promises to bring down the cost of launch. And so the utilization of space from an economic perspective is getting much more salient as we speak. And this actually brings into question several of the 
regulatory frameworks that exist since the Cold War, and I'll talk a bit about that soon. So let's start with the US. So what did we see? So in the last few years, which is interesting, we saw several documents that the US put out, and I put some of the documents here. One of the interesting uh, inclusion that I saw in US-based document, including the preamble to the Artemis Accords, they talk about utilization of space, and the argument is made that this particular utilization of resources, for example, on the moon, and uh, the moon is uh, believed to have resources like water ice that could be used for rocket fuel life sustainability, uh, it has uh, iron ore. And so what is interesting is that the documents actually talk about how countries can collaborate and develop a space utilization capability. And the Artemis Accord very much focuses on that. Now, if you look at the uh, former Trump administration's national space activities document that they put out, they also talk about establishing permanent presence in space and looks at that as a focus. The current administration, for example, which was not included in our book since it got published in December 2020, but I just looked up and saw that in the National Space Council meeting, uh, which was chaired by uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, she also talks about how critical space is to sustain human civilization itself and look at space as something that is very personal to us and not just out there. So it's a very interesting shift in mindset as well. Now, the country that I actually uh, specialize on uh, uh, for a very long time, about 20 years, is China and India. So one of the interesting uh, findings from our research in China and including their primary documents is that China had certain long-term goals that they had actually put out. And uh, some of the goals were discussed extensively by the leaders of their space program, especially the China Academy of Sciences and the China Academy of Space Technology. And so Wu Wering, who is the head of China's lunar mission, he pointed out that in the next 20 years, China is going to actually invest in lunar space resource utilization capability. And they view the uh, presence on the lunar surface as critical to upgrade China's capability for utilization, for example, of concepts like space-based solar power. So space-based solar power is a concept that talks about uh, collecting solar energy in space, uh, which is 24 hours, and beaming it back to Earth. It is not done today because it's very expensive, but uh, the argument made is that once you have certain breakthroughs, this is going to be actually one of the most far-reaching technologies, especially if we are talking about dealing with concepts like climate change. Now, the other thing that we discovered in the Chinese space uh, case study was that China's space program is also very much integrated to their military space program. So under President Xi Jinping, they talked about civil military fusion strategy. And in fact, he was the first president that established a unit within the Politburo, which talks about civil military fusion. And what was uh, insightful in our findings is that in several of his speeches, he talked about how space forms a part of China's dream and a very important part of national defense as well, and for economic and national rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So there, there was a difference between the US and China. So unlike the US, China seemed to have a very long-term vision of what they want to do. They were willing to talk about uh, basic goals that they want to achieve by 2049, which is a hundred year celebration of the People's Republic of China. And they put out this map several times through their space agencies. I mentioned China's focus on the moon. So if you look at this particular uh, data that I put through, China has actually achieved uh, till the Chang'e 5. Now, the other interesting finding, which I thought was interesting to our audience was that I look back as to when China actually announced these goals. They announced it around 2002. And so, so I look back and saw if they had actually talked about the years that they will be doing a mission, like for example, humanity's first mission, uh, robotic mission to the far side of the moon. And what is interesting is that in 2002, Ouyung Zhuang, who is the chief designer of their lunar space program and the man and the actually the brainchild behind their whole desire to have economic exploitation. He said that by 2019, 2020, in 2002, China will be sending a far side mission for resource prospecting and looking at that particular area. And what is interesting is that China actually met that goal. And then by 2020, to bring back samples from a particular area of the moon, and which is the moon's near side, and they achieved that as well. So if you see that they actually want to establish a base on the moon by 2036, but in collaboration with Russia. 
So in 2021, China signed a memorandum of understanding with Russia, and they and they hope to achieve that by within that particular time frame. Now, China also has a very serious Mars mission, as you know, and has become the second country after the U.S. to have an active rover on the on the Martian surface. The Soviet Union succeeded in landing, but the rover could not communicate. And so China actually has been able to showcase capability for deep space exploration as well. Now, uh, b- briefly before I turn to India and the middle powers, I would say that one of the interesting insights that actually builds into the argument of the book that we talk about in terms of China's desire for deep space exploration and resource utilization is their white paper, which they published in 2020, 2022 January, but it talks about uh, 2021, uh, their space activities. And so if you see uh, some of the important critical goals for China is reusable heavy lift rockets, given their goal that I pointed out in terms of uh, establishing a base research base on the moon. And they they also want to lay a foundation for exploring and developing cislunar space. So by cislunar space, the Chinese talk about an Earth-Moon economic system by 2050. And they have actually given several presentations on what they mean. They basically, what they mean is that by then they hope to utilize resources on the moon to build their permanent structure that they are thinking about. Now, China actually has very advanced civilian space capacity, and one of the rocket to watch is the Long March 5, but also the Long March 9, which they are hoping to make reusable by 2030, and which actually meets their missions to the moon and Mars by that time. Uh, I'll quickly uh, move forward to uh, India's space program, which is also a case study for us. So in terms of India's space program, I think the difference with China was that in India, at the time that we did our fieldwork, which was 2017, India's space program did not articulate the very ambitious goals that we heard in our conversations with uh, people from China's space program, which was uh, utilization of space resources, asteroid uh, mining, space-based solar power. But what is insightful is that India actually talked about more traditional goals, but we're starting to talk about space resources. And we're starting to talk about building a program within the Indian Space Research Organization to actually move forward with that particular utilization strategy. And so some of the future timelines for India, which they have put out, is of course reusable rockets as well, and to develop a human space flight program. As you know, India plans to go to low Earth orbit by 2023. Um, India's private sector, very similar to the U.S. private sector, is getting very vibrant, a very critical part of India's space program. In fact, after we wrote our book in which we criticized India for not having a very good regulatory system for their private space sector, India has actually come out and built several institutions that support their private space sector, including the inauguration of the Indian space Uh, agency, which is very much geared towards collaborating with the private sector and actually willing to uh, enable their private sector to build their rockets as well, which is a big shift for India, who was very much a state-funded space program and was very wary of opening up to the private sector. So you see this change within India as well. And so I'll finally end in my last two minutes by talking a little bit about UAE and Luxembourg. So based on what the book argues, that there is a shift towards space resource utilization, the evidence we got was through primary sourcing and interviews, and that nations were starting to actually build programs that are funded to meet some of the goals like building up a space-based solar power program, talking about building capacity for asteroid mining, talking about building capacity for resource utilization on the moon for economic advantage and not just for strategic gains, but connected to that particular concept of national, uh, basically revitalization of your own country. The UAE and Luxembourg are also playing a very critical role. I, I mean, I don't identify that at the same level that, say, for example, China or India might impact space faring capacity, but you cannot actually uh, underrate their contribution as well. In fact, when we did an assessment of UAE, we saw that the UAE actually has, is playing a very critical role, not just in building space, national space policy or regulatory framework, but also having very high end ambitions. So the UAE wants to establish a Mars city by 2117 and actually investing in capacity to build such capabilities. Now, when I spoke to some of my UAE colleagues, their argument is that we might, you might think this uh, is not possible, but this actually builds is a sector that prioritizes space uh, science development 
encourages our young people to actually invest in space and builds in funds. So they do have a very clear cut ambition of playing a very important role in, uh, especially at the level of the United Nations. And I think I'll end by saying that the country to actually watch in terms of space resource utilization and which I thought our book flagged as well is Luxembourg. So uh, Luxembourg very closely following on the heels of the United States Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act of 2015, which was signed into law by President Barack Obama, that actually uh, basically allows American citizens to own the resources they mine. Luxembourg came up with its own national legislation as well with regard to space resource uh, utilization. And they're actually uh, basically showcasing themselves as a great hub for enabling such a space resource utilization perspective. And they have succeeded. So Luxembourg is not only signing uh, agreements, for example, with the US with regard to the Artemis Accord, but has also just signed an agreement with India on space, uh, deep space exploration capability and with China. And Russia, of course, before the Ukrainian conflict, was also basically in Luxembourg to sign an MOU so that it could take advantage of some of Luxembourg's legislation. So I think I'm going to end there since I think I'm, my 15 minutes are up and I look forward to a discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Namara, that was fantastic. So, so you've alluded a little bit to um, space resource utilization um, in the form of asteroid mining and, and lunar resources, but I wonder if we, if we can back up a little bit and just expand what are the resources um, of space and, and what do you see as their strategic significance? Sure. So uh, some of the resources that I saw reflected in some of the primary documents I looked at and just through uh, secondary literature as well, one of the books that I found very useful was John Lewis's Asteroid Mining 101. Excellent book as well. But I think some of the resources, for example, if you look at, uh, uh, for example, 2554 Amum, which is a 20, uh, I think, 20 kilometer long asteroid. Uh, it has uh, uh, resources like iron ore, platinum, titanium, believed to be, right? And so the assessment based on current prices is that that could lead to trillions of dollars, if not billions. Now, we can always make an argument that once you actually mine resources in space, the price is going to come down because you will have more quantity. But let's assume that's what the resources are. The second resource, which I think uh, China and India, actually, President Kalam talked about, is uh, space-based solar power. So both of them believe that uh, humanity is actually doing itself a disservice by not uh, building capacity to uh, be able to uh, collect solar energy in space. Uh, Abdul Kalam's argument was that uh, ground solar is not advantageous when compared to space solar because it suffers from climate, weather, and you need very strong battery power. Unlike uh, If you build space, space solar power, which requires very big satellites, by the way, and that's why it's not happening. It's expensive to do it. And also you have to be able to uh, beam it through microwaves, a technology that JAXA is experimenting in, China is now experimenting in. But then we are talking about a very large scale here. So those are some of the resources. Water ice, which is a very critical uh, resource, for example, believed to be there on the moon, on the South Pole. And so water ice could, as I mentioned before, could be used as rocket fuel, but also could be used for life sustainability if you want to live on the moon. So those are some of the resources that our book actually talked about. That's great. And, and so we have um, uh, in, in solar power, um, sort of harnessing the sun for, for use on Earth. Um, there, there's, of course, the um, uh, speculation about, about the rare earth minerals believed to be in some celestial bodies, which, which lead to the um, eye-catching but maybe dubious uh, headlines about, you know, the asteroid worth ten thousand quadrillion dollars, and then there's water, which, um, in my experience, at, at least working for an asteroid mining company and and now for a space agency, um, is the resource that um, uh, governments and, and companies alike seem to be most focused on, um, both for for use of uh, in space refueling um, and radiation shielding, uh, and of course drinking water for astronauts. Um, does that does that, does that sort of square with what, what what you saw in your research? Yes, especially when you look at the uh, documents and also the secondary resource, uh, most of the uh, literature was about what you talked about in terms of what its uses could be. So, so uh, even for members of our audience who don't spend their days thinking about uh, developments of space and asteroid mining alike, um, I'm sure many of us can conjure at least an image of 
um, the original you know, space race, a, a competition between the United States and Soviet Union uh, half a century ago. Um, does that rhyme with what you're seeing or, or is, is what you're seeing distinct? That's a great question, actually, because uh, my PhD is in international relations. So I spent about seven decades now looking at uh, Cold War politics and what drove the uh, rivalry, for example, between the U.S. and the USSR, the erstwhile Soviet Union. And space actually played a very critical part of which particular ideological framework was more attractive. Is it the capitalist framework or is it the communist framework? And of course, Sputnik basically was the wake-up call in 1957. So the first, the first space race uh, can be actually simplified to uh, achieve two goals. One was for the one one country-led ideological order, let's say the U.S.-led uh, ideological order, as more attractive vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet-led ideological order. And in that, showing off capability in space, getting somewhere first, for example, getting to space first, uh, for first human in space, uh, the first human landing in space, is, it was very important uh, to showcase to other countries who were watching as to which country is more technologically capable. Now, what I think is different it was a lot about prestige. Uh, so I think the current uh, investments in space is very different. First of all, the whole landscape has changed. You do not have just two countries. You have several countries who are actually starting their own space program. It's so fascinating. In the last five years that I've been studying space, Australia started a space program. New Zealand has started a space program. The African Union is starting their own African space agency. Turkey is interested in space. Indonesia is interested in building its capability, right? So you can see that the uh, economic perspective of space. So why are these countries investing in space? First of all, because they see the economic capability of space. And secondly, I think the difference is that today we have much more focus on space as an economic venture. And that is why we have a very critical development, which is the private sector. So during the Cold War, you did not have such a role for the private sector as we speak. They played a role, but they were more a support role to the government sector. Today, you have private space companies having ambitions of their own. For example, uh, Jeff Bezos and, uh, you know, and Elon Musk talks about uh, going, for example, Musk talks about establishing a city in, on Mars, right? So you did not have such ambitions clearly articulated during the Cold War. Um, so you, your book argues that, that um, a scramble has already begun. And, and I'm curious, how, would, how do we know uh, that we're in a scramble and, and what evidence did you find? So uh, I think... The first time I recognize that this is happening is about, uh, I would say about 2015, 2016, uh, when I saw especially China's white paper in 2016 and subsequent interviews given by their, the heads of their space programs, especially their lunar uh, wall wearing and Oh Ya Yang. So they, both of them gave very fascinating speeches and they very clearly articulated an ambition, not just for sending a robotic mission to the moon and getting it back, but actually being able to develop capacity for resource, lunar resource utilization. And uh, their 2016 white paper talked about space resource utilization, and then their 2021 space paper talks about it as well. So that was the first time I found evidence that, okay, there is a shift in conversation. And then when I actually did field work in China and talked to some of their policymakers, uh, they also had very clearly uh, articulated very serious funded programs. For example, Wang Shishi, who's the father of the Long March program, he started the program on space-based solar power in 2010. So they actually established it much earlier. In the US, I saw that one of the uh, interesting evidence for a, a shift in terms of utilization of space resources came from the epistemic community first. So it was very much a conversation. As you said, planetary resources was one of the company. Uh, deep space industry, right, which were companies that talked about planetary or asteroid, uh, you know, investments and, and, and exploitation, if I may, or development. But then this was actually, we might talk about the companies, but the conversation in the U.S. about utilization of space resources started much earlier. And these were some of the companies that came as a result. One of the person who I listened to, Rick Tomlinson, who was very much behind this kind of concepts as well. And he kind of started a movement. But what I thought, so the movement from epistemic community to actual policy happened in the last five years. 
where you actually had a commercial space launch competitive act that was signed into law. You had uh, hearings in the Senate about whether there needs to be a new uh, space treaty, for example, because of this shift. And then you actually had several space policy directives that talked about utilization of space resources in the US itself. And this was followed by Luxembourg. You also had conversations in the United Nations. Greece and Belgium brought a document to the United Nations that talked about establishing a capability within the US or within the United Nations for regulation of countries that will invest in space resources. So there's a lot of evidence actually that told me that the shift had happened already and there was a scramble. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just reflecting um, personally, you mentioned the um, Space Resource Exploration and Utilization Act of 2015, uh, which is a law that as a, as a lawyer and particularly as one who was, was involved in it would say, it didn't really change, it didn't really affect any change in law and policy in the United States. Um, it, it, it was sensational, um, but, but I, I, I do think it, it, it affected a big shift um, in the conversation. Um, the, the conversation uh, internationally in the United Nations uh, space body uh, was a first alarm. Um, but then um, it, the, the idea became almost mainstream. Um, and uh, you saw countries who were not who who had um, been quite conservative um, on on the question of the utilization of space resources uh, become quite forward leaning, um, almost as if there was a, a fear of missing out. Um, and and so it's it, it was it was quite extraordinary to see how um, this act that um, as a as a law um, didn't really do much um, had maybe an outsized uh, impact on um, getting others off the fence. Uh, in, in this area. Yeah, as I said, the scramble started then, right? So as you say, uh, that was followed by Luxembourg, it was followed by India, then talking about establishing national regulation. And what was interesting is that that act actually, I, I'm not a lawyer, but just looking at it from a policy perspective, what I realized was that that particular act galvanized Luxembourg, galvanized the UAE, China. When I was in China, I talked to Lu Shopping, who's one of their very well-known space lawyers. And he argued that uh, very similarly, China might also be uh, establishing a particular regulatory framework. So I agree with you that that actually led to responses and reactions that had a deep impact on how states were viewing space. So I'm really curious um, what kind of key assumptions uh, underlie your book about the future of exploration and de development of space. Is the strategic significance of space resources really tied to um, space as such, developing and settling space? Uh, is it about sort of terrestrial applications? Is it, is it both? So, uh, so there are two aspects to the answer that I can give you. So what actually has happened is that space is starting to be viewed as valued by itself. So as you said, uh, for example, when we talk about national security, space is viewed a lot in terms of terrestrial support for military operations, or for example, communications for our civilian purposes, GPS, right? Global positioning system, our uh, economic activities, if I may. But what has shifted is that space is starting to be viewed, as I said, in terms of conceptualizing it from a value by itself, because there are these resources out there that could one day be utilized, countries are starting today to change their conversation and build policy and funded programs that is anticipating this economic future, right? So what is interesting is that uh, Bao Weiming, who is uh, the spokesperson for their space program, he gave a presentation last year where he talked about, he, his speculation, if I may, was that if China invests in a particular cislunar capacity today, that capacity will return value to about $10 trillion by 2050 annually. So you could see that they were actually articulating this from an economic perspective. And the audience was internal for Bao. It was not external. And that was also a very interesting insight for me that when, when I went to China, I noticed that there were a lot of interviews in their local channels on space, which we don't get to see. But they're pop and they're talking about space resource utilization, the lunar program, and how it's different from Apollo. So yeah, so the, the space was conceptualized as a value in itself, and I think the strategic conceptualization is that, and this is interesting, and this is where the concept of great powers come in. So if you look at China's articulation of who it is, they, China recognizes two aspects of how it is a great power. 
One is its civilizational uh, ethos and its civilizational history. And second is its economic development. And so the argument is that if you develop your economy to the level that you are the number one nation, for example, by 2050, you can inadvertently build your military capacity. And a great power has two very critical dimensions. One is their economic capability, and the second is their military capability. And space is connected to both. And that's how the strategic importance of space comes in. So as, a, as an international lawyer, I'm, I'm very curious to know whether you foresee this um, competition for space resources playing out within the bounds of the international legal framework for space as it exists today, or if you see this as a challenge uh, to that framework, possibly toppling it. Um, I suppose I should, I should maybe um, state what the framework is briefly uh, for, for, for those who don't uh, walk around with it in their head. So uh, the, 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 the this cornerstone of international law for space is set out in the um, Outer Space Treaty. And really the first principle of, uh, of, of law for space uh, is that territorial sovereignty does not extend into space and cannot extend there. So you, you cannot go claim an asteroid or the moon or a part of the moon um, as your territory, sort of extend your sovereignty there. Um, the, and, and, and so that's where the consensus ends. Uh, the, the United States has long maintained, and, and, a, and a number of countries do, um, that nothing in international law categorically precludes, uh, say, an operator from uh, extracting the resources of a celestial body uh, and utilizing that. It can't um, have sort of title to the land, to the sort of regolith beneath, uh, but you can you can pull out um, you know, what you take and, and do what you wish with it, including selling it. Um, and so with that very uh, rudimentary primer uh, for our audience, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you see it play out? Does, does, is it, um, do you see this competition playing out with, within the bounds of this framework we have, or do you, do you see it challenging and maybe replacing that framework? So um, that's, again, a very, very uh, deeply important question, because if you look at the conversations around space resource utilization that I'm talking about, right? So uh, when you listen to the uh, policy conversations in the US, China, India, Russia as well, uh, and uh, Luxembourg, UAE, Japan, the argument is that the Outer Space Treaty offers very broad frameworks that, can act that actually does not stop you, as you mentioned, from utilization of space resources. What it actually stops you is national sovereign appropriation, right? And so I haven't had actually uh, serious I'm talking about serious policymakers and who actually have impact on how their nations behave in space. Talk about exiting the Outer Space Treaty. In fact, the argument is that the Outer Space Treaty offers general supportive mechanisms. What would probably be required is an additional protocol if that comes about at all, because I know how difficult it is to have agreements, especially because space is also connected to national security. But then uh, having said that, there is the conversation that there is the requirement for a regulatory framework at the level of epistemic conversation, university frameworks, the International Institute of Space Law, the Hague Resources Working Group. These the nations find helpful because even if they are not uh, they are not mandatory or treaties, they actually offer you a framework that deals with, for example, a question like, okay, if a company goes and mine a resource on the moon, for example, how is it going to be utilized or shared? Right, because space is also the province of mankind. So those questions, uh, I think can be dealt within the framework of the Outer Space Treaty. And I do not think, at least uh, this is what my um, conclusion is, I do not think that this will unravel the Outer Space Treaty. It will in fact strengthen it because it offers you the general framework for such conversation. Now, having said that, the other aspect of looking at space as a value of its own and a strategic territory is the fact that countries are talking about cislunar domain operations, right? So when China established the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force, the first country to do it, to establish a separate space service, the U.S. established in 2019, India has a space agency 2019. I think uh, the fear uh, among middle powers, for example, countries who do not have advanced space faring capacities, for example, like China, India, or the US, I think the greatest fear is that this could lead to some kind of militarization or weaponization of space, right? And so what 
middle powers are doing, for example, the United Kingdom, is that they are bringing resolutions to the United Nations General Assembly for member states to actually discuss, for example, limiting the military activities in space, responsible state behavior, the uh, can you ban an anti-satellite weapon? Is that ever going to be possible? And these conversations actually tie into my larger argument of space resource utilization, because if you have debris in low Earth orbit, that can create problems of access and dangers, right? And so the short answer is that I don't see the international regulatory framework unraveling, but I do see that once this future comes where you have utilization of space resources, there would be the need for additional protocols. Thank you. So, so I, I want to ask you um, uh, one more question before turning to the audience questions. Um, you, your book ends with considering um, a number of scenarios. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can just share some of those with us. How, how might the future unfold? How might action or inaction by the middle powers uh, in particular change the course? Uh, sure. So I'll... I'll... I'll just share my slide quickly and I'll take you to the scenarios. So uh, the book has actually four major scenarios where uh, we see in by 2060, there is one scenario called protector of the rim that the United States takes up leadership, actually establishes enough uh, policy documents from now. The, the important point is that the, legis the policy documents and the mission sets have to be set today for it to have influence by 2060. Space is a long-term investment and capacity building. So in one of the scenarios, you see the U.S. leading. The U.S. actually anticipates a space future where you have space resource utilization capability by 2060. You have American citizens actually doing some of the activities I talked about, for example, establishing a mining capability on the moon. In that context, it's, it's a scenario where the U.S. takes leadership and India is actually number two and China is number three. And uh, India basically wants to collaborate with the U.S. as well. So it's a, it's a good, good scenario for the U.S. But then there is another scenario where actually China takes the, uh, ed, uh, which takes the lead, which it's currently actually seeming to do. For example, if you look at some of their statements, their investments, they actually are taking this particular space resource utilization capability long term, since they think very long term, 20 to 30 years ahead, very seriously. And so in that future, the U.S. actually does not anticipate a future where space resources are critical to uh, for the strategic the strategic advantage of a particular country or economic development. The U.S. Uh, policy and epistemic community uh, basically thinks that this is a hype. There is a denial that this is ever going to happen. Technology has not been showcased yet. And actually, because of those kind of mindset and thinking, the U.S. is not able to take leadership and China takes the lead. And then there is one scenario where we talk about India taking the lead. So uh, given the fact that the Indian government has actually woken up to the possibility of space resource utilization and the development of the private space sector, India establishes space agencies. And we predicted this in 2017, that once this discourse about private space and space development is going to become critical globally, India will start establishing their own private space agency. And that's what happened. In 2019, India established their own national space, uh, new space, uh, India Limited, which is a government body that looks to develop India's new space for almost some of the uh, goals that I talked about that China had articulated, which is space-based solar power, asteroid capability, deep space mining. And so it's interesting how India takes leadership. And because of this early move, India actually ends up taking leadership by 2050. The book, the last chapter of the book actually flushes this out in great detail. So this is just a snapshot, Brian, but thank you for the question. Thank you for that. Um, at this point, I'm going to, to read the questions uh, from the audience, from, from the Q&A box. Um, and I'll start with, uh, in your research, have you seen any realistic efforts to develop a space elevator? Oh, sorry, what, a space elevator? A space elevator, yes. Yes, uh, yes I have. So uh, there is one company that I, I, I basically gave a presentation, Liftport, that is actually uh, wanting to build a space elevator. And in fact, uh, some of the uh, important areas that they had pointed out in their uh, presentation was that they're not just looking at the US, but also Singapore, for example, as a, as a hub for building that capacity. So yes, I have actually come across uh, Michael Lane. He's, I think, the, uh, he, he leads uh, Liftport. 
and uh, very seriously investing in a space elevator uh, concept for several several years now. So yeah, I have seen uh, such concepts being developed. Brian, please. Yeah. To add because I'm sure you know much more than me. I've 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 uh, I, I, I've never heard about a uh, a an effort afoot to, to make a space elevator. I I, I know that the dream of um, getting things to space without you know using chemical rockets uh, or sort of disposable launch vehicles. You you could um, you know get a lot more things into space economically if you didn't if if, if you had a space elevator. Um, the next question is, how do you foresee public and private investment in space-based uh, defense evolving? Specifically, uh, do you anticipate a space-based arms race? So a uh, public-private partnership is actually a critical component of the current space age. So uh, as you see, NASA actually uh, encouraged uh, the development of the private space sector, and uh, it, it plays a critical role in the U.S. today. So, for example, the U.S. has uh, capability to send uh, astronauts to the International Space Station today because of SpaceX's development, which I think they succeeded last year. Think of it. If the U.S. had been dependent on the Soyuz uh, rockets to take American astronauts and bring them back, the Ukrainian crisis shows you that Russia actually basically refused to fly one web satellites uh, because of what was happening in Ukraine, and they wanted conditions met. For example, that OneWeb should remove all its stakes in the UK uh, from the UK government, and I can go more into detail on that. Now, do I see a uh, space uh, and China also public-private partnership is a very critical component of China's uh, space uh, development. In fact. One of the documents I would urge the audience to read is called Document 60 that was put up by the Politburo of the State Council. And that's where they highlight the critical importance of developing China's private space sector, including uh, rocket capability. And some of their private companies have launched into space uh, since the last five years. Now, do I see a space arms race happening? So I think, uh, as Brian would tell you, the Outer Space Treaty bans any placement of weapons of mass destruction in space. So I do not see that happening unless you have a country that says that it does not have the obligation of that of the Outer Space Treaty or exits the treaty. Right. There is a you can exit the treaty by giving one year notice. Um, I think where you could see a. Uh, uh, a militarization of space increasing is through ASAT weapon capability, which we saw in the last few years. India has uh, tested an ASAT weapon in 2019. Russia tested it just before in, the, in uh, November 2021. And so in, the, in that particular context, I can see that once countries start investing in civilian space capacity, build up their own infrastructure in space, they would see the need for some kind of counter, counter space capability, which is exactly what happened to India. India was never interested in an ASAP weapon till it saw the Chinese test of 2007 and realized that, oh my God, our space infrastructure is under threat here. We need to have some signaling that we can do the same. So I could see that happening. The other important thing is that I don't think the Outer Space Treaty bans conventional weapons in space. So there could be the development of capability as well. It, it does not, except for on the moon and other celestial bodies. Um, as you probably know well in, in, in audience audience members may know as well, um, there's, there's um, weaponization of space or, or, or at least investment in, in um, counter space weapons and counter counter space weapons um, has been a thing really since the first Gulf War, um, where uh, in, in that war, the United States um, military um, demonstrated a decisive advantage from GPS particularly precision guided munitions. Um, and, and my understanding is, is from that point, it became published doctrine uh, if, if, if among would-be adversaries um, to uh, in, invest in the capabilities to sort of neutralize that advantage. Um, and so, you know, counter space weapons like anti-satellite weapons, ASATs, and then things to counter those, and 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 so forth. And so, it's it's been uh, it's been ongoing for for quite a while. Although I think that. Um, the last administration's uh, rhetoric around the creation of the space force probably uh, shined more sort of public attention on it than had been before. Yeah, and what is interesting is that China and Russia actually brought a particular uh, treaty, a draft treaty, to the Conference on Disarmament in 2008, where they talked about banning uh, anti-satellite weapons, right? But the U.S. position was that uh, it did not uh, cover stockpile of ASAT weapons, 
and uh, did not include weapons on earth. So in case of conflict, as we have seen in cases of conflict, the nations could easily use those stockpiles. They can ban it. Testing could be banned. But if you do not remove the actual capability on earth, you can always activate it. So That's right. Next question is, how, if at all, do you see the rise of space tourism adding to the urgency of space-based space, space -based law or regulation? I think that's a question for Brian, but I can take, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just give a line or two. I think uh, if you look at space tourism, right, I think one of the conversation around uh, regulation, uh, if I may, is that how do you classify this particular activity, right? That was one of the biggest conversation I heard. Uh, I think the second is that if you have space tourism, for example, from all nations, now it's just a very, few, very limited. What happens if this activity increases, right? What if space tourism leads to the establishment of structures, for example? Think, let's think of a scenario. So today we have uh, space tourism to suborbital space, which is Blue Origin. And I think SpaceX was able to send to orbital space, right? And so what happens if the, the uh, desire of uh, SpaceX to be able to send artists and others around the moon and then establish permanent presence? What happens if, Ila, uh, if Jeff Bezos achieves his uh, dream of establishing an O'Neillian kind of colony? Famous book by Jared O'Neill, The Final Frontier. And he said that that is one of his dreams. So what happens if you have such structures? What happens if developing nations and other countries argue that this is not beneficial for them because they cannot access it, right? So Brian, I'll, I'll leave it to you. I just gave you my thoughts on what the overall conversation was. Thanks. I'll, I'll take your invitation. So on, on space tourism itself, the, the, um, the starting point for, for law and regulation um, in this sort of embryonic stage is really sort of focused on, you know, safety to the, the tourists and, 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 um, and it's inherently unsafe. So, so making sure it's, it's safe as possible and, and tourists understand the risk and then sort of safety of those not participating. Um, uh, Namrata, you, you sort of run the tape forward to imagine a, a future with, um, you know, um, you know, orbital hotels and, and things like that. And that's not too hard to imagine. Um, there are companies working on um, private space stations for beyond uh, the, the International Space Station. Um, there are private tours going to the International Space Station. Um, and so it does raise um, a number of questions. Um, you, uh, so much of the international legal framework for space around astronauts and the protections afforded to them um, was, was forged in this paradigm of these public servants um, who are taking great risk for, for humankind. Um, and uh, are, are tourists sort of, you know, do they deserve the, the same protections and treatment? I, I won't opine, but, but the question is being asked. Let's see, I want to um, ask uh, next question. How has the conflict in Ukraine and the role of the private sector satellite companies impacted the way countries are approaching the space domain? In addition, how long-standing spacefaring nations, such as the US and China, are looking to support emerging spacefaring nations to strengthen their presence in space? Sorry, I muted myself because the kids suddenly got very loud. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> I, that's, that's, that's okay. And it, it was a long, uh, a long question. So, so the, um, how is the conflict in Ukraine in, in the role of private sector satellite companies um, impacting the way countries are approaching the space domain? Sure, yeah. So actually, Ukraine is bringing up several interesting insights on space cooperation, right? So one is that Russia, uh, in some of their, uh, you know, internal conversations, which you see from Russia TV or Moscow Times, is that uh, they see, uh, for example, uh, the fact that Musk, Star uh, Elon Musk's Starlink is providing uh, satellite internet and Musk is tweeting very openly about it as a kind of intervention, right, in the conflict zone. And so this brings up very interesting questions, right, legal questions, actually. So in that particular scenario, and Moss tweeted it, that's why I can openly say it, uh, is that will that make Starlink a, a target then, right? Because it's supporting uh, 
operations of some sort in Ukraine. Maxer is actually the company that offered us images of the 40, 40 mile long Russian convoy, right? And so uh, the role of the private space uh, sector actually has grown enormously for offering us, for example, what are the images useful for if you talk about uh, Ukrainian conflict? One is that it allows, for example, the Ukrainian military to see where the Russian troops are. Second, it can it allows the Ukrainian military to see damages and where damages have occurred. It allows the Ukrainian military to see routes and where Russians are, if, in, if you are able to get uh, satellite images in real time. And so uh, I think this is raising a lot of interesting questions. Now, in terms of space cooperation itself, right? So we have seen that in terms of conflict, when uh, we talk a lot about space cooperation in times of peace. Now, what happens to space cooperation between two countries that are seemingly adversarial, right? So in this particular context, we see that the European Space Agency has uh, stopped all kinds of space cooperation with Russia. Russia has uh, taken back its uh, space personnel from French New Guinea. Uh, Roscosmos has tweeted that it might exit the International Space Station much earlier, since 2025. And the biggest uh, impact on the private space sector out of the conflict is what I mentioned. So OneWeb is a UK-based uh, space startup that is thinking of that is uh, wanting to build a Leo, low Earth orbit-based constellation of 648 satellites that is going to offer uh, satellite internet to the world. Right, uh, very similar to Starlink, much smaller though. And so OneWeb actually has uh, India's Bharti Tel as the largest investor. And then it has the UK government. It actually was bankrupt and it was saved by these investments. So OneWeb uh, on May, March 4th uh, had 36 satellites atop a Soyuz module to be launched to build their low Earth constellation. Roscosmos sent out a letter saying that you have to meet two conditions. One is that you have to ensure that the 36 satellites that are launched will not be helping Ukrainian military look into Ukraine. So that was the number one condition. The second condition was that the United Kingdom has to give up its shares. So you can see that the conflict is already starting to affect private space company and losing a launch can be very expensive for a company. And almost all the launches of OneWeb are on the Soyuz module. So you can imagine the impact that it has had on that particular company. And so, and finally, I'll say that Roscosmos tweeted, and in fact, uh, the uh, head of Roscosmos stated that if uh, there is an attack on a Russian uh, space system, that would be treated as an act of war. So you can already see how it's spilling over into what is defined as war and the impact of the private space sector as well. And, and viewing the private space sector as a contributor to an adversary's capability. Well, you've um, amazingly answered se several of the subsequent questions for, from, from the audience, it, 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 at least uh, it, indirectly. Um, so we, we have about four minutes left. Um, I want to ask you maybe one, one last question. Um, that is, in light of China and Russia's joint statement for an enhanced economic and technological partnership in February of 2022, how is India now approaching its military technical cooperation with Russia? And to what extent uh, is this dynamic informing China's strategy? So uh, India actually, and, and that's something I've thought through uh, quite a bit, because uh, in the last few years, Russia has started getting uh, strategically uh, closer to China. I use the word strategic because these are strategic end goals for why there is a stronger relationship between Russia and China, including the 6,000 word joint statement that they put out when President Putin visited uh, China just uh, in the start of the Winter Olympics in February, right? So... Uh, now, for India, this is an important strategy of hedging, right? So India has very deep defense relationships with Russia. Uh, when President Putin visited uh, India in December of 2021, India and Russia signed a 10-year defense agreement, which included space cooperation as well. So I think uh, how India is actually viewing this is that I think it's seeing the conflict in two different dimensions. On one hand, it views Russia's uh, 
technology development of India's defense capability and space cooperation is very beneficial. India's would uh, astronauts have trained in the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Center. India has deep space collaboration with Russia. And this relationship is very historical and very deep, right? And so I think what India sees is that if you uh, at all have to uh, or have an alternative source of uh, defense and space collaboration, it has to be at a cost that is uh, cost beneficial to India. Russia offers India's, India capacity at a very, very cost uh, efficient capability. Secondly, when you talk about defense and space collaboration, Russia and uh, India has signed agreements where Russia is willing to have their capabilities manufactured in India, which is not what India is getting in its deals, for example, with France or the US. So there is a competitive frame there. How is China, is, is that the last question? How is China viewing all this? Yeah. Uh, India, Russia, or uh, in, in India, Russia. So I think China actually, uh, when you look at China's uh, collaboration with Russia, it is different from India. So uh, it is not. It it has some components of a defense and military and space collaboration. But China has reached a stage where it is able to develop its indigenous capacity, has showcased capability to go to places that Russia has not. For example, Mars and the far side of the moon. Uh, China has actually uh, indigenized several of its uh, capability and focuses on autarky. So the relationships, uh, strategic aspects are very different. I think there is a tendency to conflate it within a conflict diet, if I may. And I don't think it exists in that particular framework today. It is still very, very divergent and different. Well, well thank you so much. We're, we're at the time now. I've been thinking about these issues uh, more or less every day for a decade or so. And I've learned a lot and you've made me look at it in a new way. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that.